and I update from Ethan uh, with Red Beacon, who won the conference three years ago. Uh, Brad uh, with Room 77 uh, won two years ago. We asked him to give us a quick seven minute update on his company. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Brad from Room 77. Thanks, Jason. Um, and it's fantastic to be back. I mean, I have to start off by saying as both an angel, as an investor, I run an investment firm in Boston, and as an entrepreneur, somebody who's founded a few companies and gone through all the struggles of building a comp company, truly having a fest that celebrates it with people who are on your side, it's an amazing thing. And so let me just start off by saluting you and saying thank you. It's a great opportunity. Um, yes, sir. All right, grab us, we're in. When we, when we set out, you know, a couple years ago to launch Room 77, we had a very kind of modest goal. And the goal was simply that after 10 years in online travel, we wanted to provide better search. Um, in the hotel category in particular, there hadn't been much innovation. We were grizzled veterans of the space. We had hung around it for a long time. I was on the board of From Orbits to Hotel Tonight and realized there were a lot of dirty little secrets of the space that weren't being showed. A couple of those we talked about at the time. One was what we called adverse room allocation. When we book through these online travel sites, we end up in a bad room in the hotel. And I just found it irritating as a consumer, as a traveler. Um, but we also knew there were a lot of other places that needed greater transparency greater transparency and greater innovation. Over the last two years, um, a lot has changed. The company has grown substantially. In December, we announced that we raised $30 million at over a $100 million valuation. We're now booking over 1,000 room nights a day on behalf of our customers, and we're doing over a million searches a month. But rather than kind of drone on about kind of what's happened over the last two years, let me take you to the consumer experience and I have Don Dodge sitting in the front row, and I remember a question Don asked me you know, during the panel when we were up here pitching. And Don said, you know, th this room view technology you're doing is cool, but how is it going to work in the overall flow of shopping for a hotel room, and why is this going to matter? So if you fast forward to a real use case, uh, go back to the, the last slide. So tonight, I'm staying at the W Hotel. I showed up, and I didn't have a booking. So I ran a search. As you can see, one of the very basic things is, you know, everybody will look at this and say, ah, oh, it's meta search, Brad. There's no innovation there. It's just marginal improvement. Why waste your time on this? But what you see here is, for this hotel, we actually found a rate for tonight that was 218 bucks. The cheapest price on Priceline was $363. On Expedia, it was $383. We even threw Kayak in. A lot of you guys probably use Kayak. The cheapest price on Kayak for tonight was $299. And the fact of the matter is that we have now sourced more and indexed more prices and availability for hotel rooms than anybody on the planet. In this case, it was a triple A rate. There happened to be 52 million triple A households in the country. And finally, we've given them a place to go to find uh, uh, a great deal in a hotel room. So I save 100 bucks, and importantly, I pay at the hotel, I earn my Starwood points, uh, and I'm free to cancel. But if you go to the next step, we don't leave people hanging there. Remember the room views, Don? You know, and the blueprints and the digital blueprints, and everybody said, well, what are you going to do with that? Well, for me, it was always about, I want to get a good deal. I want to, you know, I want to have that schmuck insurance to know that I'm not paying too much for the hotel. But I also want to get a good room. And so I knew that room... You know, the rooms ending in 17 were good rooms for this hotel, had good views. But what we did, instead of forcing consumers to have to do this, we actually created a room concierge service. So now anybody who uses the site, finds a hotel, four star or above, actually gets a room concierge assigned, an automatic email is propagated using that room intelligence and requesting a room on their behalf. So when I checked in yesterday to, uh, to the W Hotel, I was confident I got a good deal. They gave me an upgrade to a corner room, ending in 17 with a great view in the city. And from my perspective, mission accomplished. We're passionate about consumers, and consumers are showing us their own loyalty with over a 50% repeat rate. Um, 
Obviously, the hard thing in the category, to Robert's earlier point, to some of the panelists, how do you break through? And we're doing all of the normal things. You know, I call it an all of the above strategy, distribution, SEM, social, et cetera. But fundamentally, it's about building a product that consumers love, where they have real savings and they come back to. Over the course of the next few weeks, you'll see us consolidating all of this in both mobile web, iOS, and our Android apps. So very similar experience for the consumer. We want them to have a tap and a swipe to be able to get the room, to get the room concierge, et cetera. Today, we have hundreds of thousands of hotels on a global basis in the platform. But the same deal, if, if I get the W Hotel, click on it, go to the next slide. An important innovation with mobile is that meta search really doesn't work well on mobile. So when you go to, when, when you use meta search on mobile, clicking out to all of these different sites where they don't have mobile optimized experiences, it just is not a fulfilling customer engagement. So what we've done now is pioneered something we're calling meta book, and we'll be rolling out in earnest over the course of the next, uh, the next several weeks. And what meta book is, is closing the loop on the transaction. So rather than shuffling you off to Expedia, shuffling you off to Travelocity or Orbitz, we're going to create a wallet where we already have your credit card information. So we'll pass that booking information to those partners. You'll never have to leave the site. And you'll get your confirmation without ever leaving our, our, our app. So Google's been talking about the wallet for a long time. This is in, a case in point where vertical search, prompted by the disruption of mobile, is really going to give use to that wallet. Um, so now that I have my credit card on file there, I can literally book hundreds of travel sites over the course uh, of the months ahead without ever uh, leaving this, this single app. I'll, I'll finish by simply saying this. I know time is short. When we launched Room 77, a lot of the questions when we were on stage that day is, do you have it all figured out? How do these room views, these blueprints, translate into a real business. And I think when we look back on it, it wasn't the alpha that day that won the launch contest for us. It was that we chose a massive multi-hundred billion dollar category, one where there had been little innovation. We built a terrific team and we showed early evidence that we could do things that were disruptive to the incumbents, to the Expedias, to the Pricelines, to the Kayaks. And it was for that reason that the judges ultimately said, we don't know exactly how they're going to get there, but we think this team is going to be capable of continuing this innovation, continuing to disrupt the incumbents. And I think as our, you know, both the, the customer use and the validation in the financial markets has shown um, that, we, uh, that we have indeed hopefully pushed the ball down the court and are on our way to making uh, Launch proud for having chosen us that day. Thank you. Great. It's a great update. Um, so um, you were here, Robert, I think. And, and so what do you think of the progress? I mean, did you have an idea when you saw Room 77 that yeah, it, it was going to be successful? What was it about his presentation then? Because it, it did have a wow because, factor. It woke me up because it had a wow factor. It, it showed me something that I couldn't get other places with the pictures. And it was just a well done presentation. And it got me to try the app. Right, so there's some lessons in there for entrepreneurs, I think. You did have a little pizzazz I mean, in there with that room. View. I mean, this morning I bought, I bought those uh, cubes uh, while on the freeway. I was listening to your show while driving in here, and I pulled over and bought those cubes. That's what it takes. It takes you to get me to buy something, you know, try right. something. Capture your imagination. Yeah. Which for you is a little bit lower than most, but it is. It's a, it's a low you know bar. That you, how many, it's a low how bar. many? products do you buy a month, do you think? How many UPS boxes are coming? Not that many. Amazon, not that many. I, how many apps do I try? Yeah. That's a better question. Yeah, how Probably, many apps? I don't know, a dozen, two dozen. Uh, that get do, a dozen my or email. two dozen? There's lots of people who, who try to get me and I read them and it's like, no, not for me. A but, dozen or two dozen a month? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah I, I, you know, yeah, I just went through last night and I threw away 24 apps, so huh. that gives right. you an idea. So what do you guys think of the progress? It looks really nice. It, it, and it, it looks like the business is, is expanding and continuing to go. And that's, you know, what, one thing long term, so, you know, there's, there's the launch and then there's everything, reality. the reality. And I watched 2,400 startups on a list on Facebook. And so I watched the cadence of shipping new features or how you talk to the customers and 
the wins that you have. It's not just about launch. It's about what you do afterwards and, and can you get that cadence. Healthy companies have a cadence to them. They ship new things all the time and they're talking about new, new things to do with their products. And that, and I, I would say one final lesson for me, Jason, is I've been around the category for a long time. There was Faircast, there was Fairchase, there was Sidestep. Kayak came around in 05. Trivago didn't launch to 08. There's been probably three and a half billion dollars created in enterprise value in the vertical search category. They weren't any of the first four or five companies that launched in this category. I happen to think that the disruption caused by these mobile devices is going to really ignite the value of vertical search. Yeah. Because my patience for all these different pop-ups and going to all these different places like, like TripAdvisor has served up to us for years just doesn't exist. Yeah. So we think that we're excited when we look at it. It's not about being the first yeah. to show up. It's about delivering the best what, experience. You, you know, uh, Brad, what do you think about Hotel Tonight, which yeah. took what, sort of what you're doing, but just made it to buy, buying hotels for tonight. And yeah, uh, how did you miss that? I'm an investor and on the board, so oh. I'm a believer. Um, you know, Hotel Tonight is... Because they have the Westin for 139 tonight, so... <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> which is a it, pretty good deal. <laughs> it, it's a retailer, and from a Room 77 perspective, they want to have Hotel Tonight, just like they want to have all the other retailers, in their marketplace. So they're two different use cases, um, but I think that, you know, again, Hotel Tonight is in the genre of other companies we've seen, whether it's Uber, et cetera, that are trying to turn this into a remote control. And for those guys, all of us trying to turn this into a remote control, for doing the important things we need to do, and most of those things are occurring right now or tonight. Awesome, well done, Brad. Okay, and next up is uh, Sonata, uh, speaking of enterprise, and here is uh, Sonata, this is great. Go ahead, guys. Thanks. Hi. Good job. <laughs> Uh, my name is Pat, Tested. this is Shalish, and we're here to talk about Sonata. Um, Sonata is the world's first enterprise cloud search engine. Uh, and what that means is that we index, crawl, and then do some crazy graph analytics on all of your enterprise data living up in these cloud services, and then put a single search box in front of it. We're going to talk about how easy and quick it is to use, and Amy here is going to help us. So Amy's having a shitty day. When uh, Amy got into the office this morning, her boss pulled her aside and said, Amy, um, the hypothetical worst case scenario, the thing that could never happen, happened. On the way into work this morning, Michael literally got hit by a car. Now, he's okay, just a few bones broken, um, but in 10 minutes, you have to go and present to our most important client a sales meeting that he was gonna have, and you need to sell them a thousand more seat licenses. Uh, here are Michael's credentials to Google Apps, like get in his email, see what you got, find out what's going on. So Amy's obviously a little bit freaked out, but she's going to get through this because she has Sonata, the world's first enterprise search engine, cloud search engine. So first thing she does is go up to settings here, and this is a list of things she's currently connected to, Google Apps, Salesforce, Zendesk, Yammer. She's going to add Michael's Google Apps account. One click, types in Mike's credentials, hits allow. And that's it. She now has a full enterprise cloud search engine right on top of that. It's sort of that box.net experience, super easy to get going. Okay, she knows two things about this company that she has to deal with. First of all, the contact name there is Bob Smith. Second of all, the company's name is Acme Corp. So she's going to look for Bob Acme. First result that comes up here is straight out of Salesforce. This is what you would hope. If she was trying to call into this guy, this is what she would want to see. She can call him, email him right from this screen. Um, but right now, he's calling her in 10 minutes, not the other way around. The next thing is kind of interesting, though. It looks like in the last few days, someone from Acme Corp filed a Zendesk customer support ticket against uh, Synergy 5, the product she has to sell them, on iPad. Well, so she's a salesperson. She's about to go into a, customer, uh, into a sales meeting with a customer that has open customer support tickets. That's something that will freak her out a little bit. Scrolling down a little bit further, she sees this email between Bob and, uh, and Mike. It looks like Bob thought, Bob from Acme, thought that the cost of the product was $5,000 a year, not $5,000 a month. So now she has a situation where she's going into a sales meeting, she has open customer support tickets and active pricing objections, any salesperson would be freaked out. Okay, 
she now has another frame of reference here. She knows it's Synergy 5 iPad. That's a product she has to sell these guys. She knows nothing about it. She's on a different product line. So she's going to search for Synergy 5 iPad. First thing that pops up there is uh, straight out of Evernote. This is uh, Synergy 5 iPad issues. Does not work. Okay, what the hell was Mike thinking? This is their most seasoned uh, sales guy, and he set up a meeting where there's active customer objections, pricing issues, and the product just doesn't work that they're trying to sell them. What the hell's going on? And then she sees it. Scrolling down a little bit, on the right-hand side there, there's a post from the Synergy product manager in Yammer. And it looks like they're releasing Synergy 6 this week with an iPad support and a revamped, uh, revamped pricing model. And that was it. That was the missing piece of the puzzle that she needed to be able to go in and close that deal. And that's what Sonata does. Sonata helps you find the, uh, the needle in your enterprise data haystack that'll help you close the deal or make a sale or hire a new, cust or hire a new uh, employee or write some code or you finish a report, whatever it is. And that's what we're doing. So we would love for you guys to try um, the world's first enterprise cloud search engine at sonata.com. We uh, also, we are rolling out today slowly. We also have an uh, iPhone version in the works. We are hiring uh, big data and graph experts, so if anyone's interested, we're doing some really cool graph analytics work, really fun stuff, and we're raising a seed series. If uh, any of you guys are interested, <laughs> um, please contest at founders at Sonata.com. Thank you so much. Okay, well done, well done. That was a very concise uh, explanation. Josh, Enterprise, we just talked about it on the panel. What do you think? Enterprise search, meta search. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as, as companies use more of these applications, the idea of having cross-functionality is going to be interesting. Some of the use cases you were describing, um, it seems to me that most businesses would have processes that were more developed. So if I'm a sales rep, you know, I want to have that information in Salesforce. It's not going to be, I think it's less likely to be scattered around. Have you thought about, you know, is there a specific, um, you know, business process that you think you'd tie to, or is this more of an ad hoc solution? It's definitely more of an ad hoc solution. I mean, what, it, your, your question's very good. So you would keep a lot of this data in Salesforce. So there's certainly a, an early part of this, which is actually filling a product feature hole that Salesforce have, which is they can't, you can't do certain deep search features in their documents. So if you are keeping a lot of attachments and stuff like that, you can use this to actually search that. We didn't get into those things, um, but that's the first part. But second of all, it is mostly for ad hoc. I mean, at the end of the day, so much of the business process around this is ad hoc. It's, you know, you get a call, you get a customer, you, you want to look up if anyone else in your company has uh, calling into this particular account. And so this is a great way, you just type it in, it'll find it for you very easily. Great, um, next question, let's get another question. <laughs> I don't want you to just get one question. That's okay. Yeah, so so your assumption is that everything that I have is put into the cloud, right? But there's so much stuff that I keep on my PowerPoint, on my hard drive. What, what is it that you don't work with? Where does this use case fail? What, what APIs and cloud servers are you not looking at? Are you, are you unable to sort of get access to? Yeah, the, so to kind of answer that, I'll talk a little bit about our pricing model, which I didn't discuss at all. I mean, we have kind of a tiered pricing model with the highest one being an enterprise tier, and that's the one where we actually want to have a, basically an on-premise server so you can connect to things that are behind the firewall, SharePoint, stuff like that. Um, things that are on, like an actual, we have a client that we've written that will actually sit on your desktop and crawl your, your file system on your hard drive. So there's a lot of ways to kind of address that problem, um, but a big hypothesis of ours is that this is the future. Companies are going this direction. Every company will be on the cloud like this, um, hopefully, and, and the ones that aren't, it's a different Next market. Question. Next question. How are you gonna get uh, distribution? Yammer was very clear that they were gonna get us all to try it and then tell our friends at work to get on it as well, and it spread like a virus through our companies. How, <laughs> how are you gonna get distribution? So we, we have a small viral aspect to this where you can share searches, and so that's kind of a cool feature because you can share a search that's your data that someone else can just look at really quickly. Um, the other part of it is we hope I mean, we can go into a lot, of, we have a lot of different channels we want to attack, um, you know, but obviously word of mouth is going to be really important, and then we think there actually will be a lot of channel partners. Every one of these companies that we've talked about are all developing channel partners. Salesforce, Box, all these companies have people to go in and Final help question. you move to the cloud. Do you have any distribution partners today? We're, we're working with two of the biggest uh, Salesforce integrators that we want to work on. It's basically, it's so easy to do that you can check box, get it going. Great, awesome. Let's hear it for Sonata. Right. Thanks, guys. Well done, well done. I always train the entrepreneurs that they should be able to answer the question in one breath. So when you get down and you have to reload, that's the end of the answer. <laughs> he didn't listen um, that time. But okay. Uh, yes, next, join us. Please uh, welcome to the stage, Zillabyte. 
Thank you. Hi, I'm Roger from Zillabyte, and I'd like to tell you a story about one of our customers named Bob. Bob works in sales at a payment processor, and he's noticed over the last two quarters his best deals have come from sales. He's really interested in replicating that. Should he do cold calling? No. Let me show you a better way. He comes to Zillabyte, and he's given this prompt, find more companies like. Bob remembers his best deal from last month, Umami SF, and he enters that URL in here. Now he's presented with Would You Like McDonald's? McDonald's makes central IT decisions. He knows that's not a very good customer. He votes no. This sounds like a, a good place. Sure, he'll throw that one in there. Gary Danko. Bob's actually been to Gary Danko. He definitely wants all that cash flowing through his payment processor. As Bob continues to train the algorithm, let me tell you what's going on underneath. We've created unique attributes for tens of millions of companies, and we're performing cluster analysis right now and helping Bob model his ideal customer. Once Bob's done training the algorithm, he's going to apply our similarity filter. It's going to whittle down the number of people he should be talking to from tens of millions to something more manageable. Now let's take a look at the top, because this is really where Zillabyte comes to life. You can see that the primary reason that these customers are being suggested is that they use OpenTable. That's pretty interesting. Bob knows anecdotally that's probably true as well. Well, let's take a look at the minor signals as well, things that Bob may not have thought about. So these companies have PDFs on their website. That's pretty cool. Like, they probably have their menus there. And they have Animoto. That makes total sense, too. This is often used by restaurants to put up videos. Let's take a look at a, at a company on the list here, Upstream Brewery. So Upstream Brewery, look under Operations here. You'll see, yep, yep, PDF links, open table. That's why the algorithm threw them in there. Uh, but this company actually is in Omaha, Nebraska. And Bob's not interested in getting out of San Francisco just for now. So he's going to go back, and he's going to add a new filter here. He's going to put Geography. And Bob's just going to uh, tailor it here for San Francisco. He's going to apply that filter, and he's going to see companies there. So this is our customer recommendation engine. It is Pandora for leads. Uh, and let me show you the next feature we're working on. It's called a Zillabyte Alert. And this is where Zillabyte really comes to life. So we come here, and Bob's going to be notified daily through his email when a customer comes into this cluster. So if there is a restaurant here in San Francisco that installs OpenTable, Bob's going to be notified. Now, maybe you don't care about OpenTable. That's fine. What if you sell social media management software? Someone installs Facebook. That seems pretty compelling. Or what if you sell customer support and you want to know when user voice is installed? That's the power of Zillabyte. We're unlocking this business web that's only been used, that's only been available for larger companies now. We want to democratize that ability for every company on the world. So that's, uh, Bob's not our only happy customer. We just completed a case study with another customer who indicated to us that their conversion rate went up by 35%, something we're very proud of. We're able to impact their bottom line right away. So that's Zillabyte. It's Pandora for leads, and we'd love to help you impact your bottom line. Cool. OK, awesome. Panel, uh, Robert, I see you I, nodding. What do you think of Pandora for sales? Leads? I want to put in there, uh, find me people who are using Amazon so I can go and uh, turn them into Rackspace customers. Can you do that kind of level um, of? Like, if you were at OpenTable, you would want to see if anybody's on a competitor of OpenTable so you would know somebody's coming into your market. That's right. Some of the signals are more obfuscated. The overall thing, like, so we can do subdomain analysis. So I hope they don't mind if I give a specific example, which you can say, does zendesk.twilio.com exist? So you can get, gather some business intelligence that way. The overall way to think about the problem is that there are easier things to model right away, but everything can be modeled, you know, as we make progress and as we get more users. Cool. I think if you look at it from like the way sales works, if you tied it in with LinkedIn, that would be good because it's not just the company, but usually you know good salespeople want to see how they're connected to the folks there, right? So if it was integrated with LinkedIn, I think that we would actually be good. have that integration. We didn't yeah. show it today, but yeah. you can add a social filter and you can see people within your first and second degree connections. So it's it's funny you, you describe it as a sales solution. It strikes me it's actually a more of a marketing solution. I I would try and sell to the VP of marketing and the lead gen folks who are going to be trying to prospect, and instead of I should call this company, it's I should drop a campaign to this company and then try and drive my funnel. Yep. Uh, uh, to be frank, we're indifferent who wants to pay us, but we think this is a great way to undiscover, especially with self-service platforms, have very limited information about the external attributes of their company. How it's do you get paid, like by the way? data scientist, right? Like Josh was like, yeah. it, there's somebody who sits between marketing and sales who's like this data scientist that never existed before. So, I mean, at least with our companies, it's very rare that salespeople are actually just straight up cold calling. They, yeah. they want a qualified lead, so most companies now have a separation between a marketing team that generates leads and then the salespeople execute yeah. on Yeah, like, like all, the, all the companies out in the expo hall, they're going to collect, let's say, 800 business cards. Can you scan those business cards and put that in there and get some commonalities of 
what their salespeople should go after right, right away? We can determine, we can use the machine learning to discover any cluster in there. So the answer is yes. Uh, we don't have that built yet, but that's something that can be. The That'd key be is this, it's a business-centric database. How do you get paid also? I'm sorry. I'm sorry? How do you get paid? How much do you charge? So right now it's a, it's a freemium model. So we want the recommendation engine to be free to increase distribution. And then we'll charge for the alerts. We'll probably do something like one alert for $100 and then scale it up to like as many alerts as you want for $1,000 a month. In conversations with cus on customer discovery visits, we know our customers are paying somewhere between uh, $10,000 and $100,000 a month for this data acquisition for lead demand, oh, demand yeah. generation. How, how accurate is your engine? You know, I, I, I've looked at building the stuff before for, you know, some things that I did when I was operating at Google. Like, you know, some of your first leads was Visit Reno Tahoe, which, you know, again, is not a restaurant. And then you had a couple other things like the San Jose downtown website as some of your top leads uh, on yep. demo. So that's another key point is that the rec that's another reason we wanted to make the, the freemium model, to be frank. It's a, it's a probabilistic model. I mean, you can prune it, you can, you can have a data scientist sitting there all the time, but you're always going to have a bad lead in the top 1,000 for sure and probably even in the top 100. So that's why I think that it's best to make that product free and then learn from it and then build on with the alerts where people can build more custom um, signals. How are you going about kind of validating this with early customers? So if you go around the valley and you go to any startup, they're probably building a web crawler and they're looking for a specific HTML tag. And they're saying, once we get that tag, let's find out who that point of contact is. So I think we're just trying to scale that process. And if you just ask your portfolio companies, almost every company in the Valley is doing some, some variation of this. Awesome. Any more questions? Let's hear it for Zillowite. <laughs> and let's welcome Gablet. Go get him, Freddie. I mean, Frankie. No, I mean, Freddie. Thank you, Jason. Inside joke. This is Zoe. Zoe loves life, hates being bored, and worst of all, really fears missing out on all the really beautiful things happening around her right now. The problem for Zoe is for her to stay on top of everything happening where she is. She has to stay on top of all of this. That's crazy. And that's before she's even thought about the local communities, the businesses, the charities, the forums, even the pub quizzes. For her, the pursuit of knowing everything going on is impossible because there was no one source until she discovered Gablet. The first ever search site for finding everything and anything happening around you, no matter what, no matter where. Let me illustrate by taking you through Gablet through the eyes of Zoe. Zoe met Fred at that music festival last week and they're going out on a date together this weekend. So she jumps onto Gablet and she types in live music under 10 bucks. She then types in art, dreaming of that Ferris Bueller's moment in front of the picture. And then she types in happy hour because she hopes to get lucky. Thank you. Zoe's thrilled. She loves it. She's just done three simultaneous searches, which means she can see what's happening this weekend in context with each other. And she's never had that before, but better still, Zoe knows that all of this information comes from all of the sources she would have had to have searched one by one, and it's still more comprehensive. What would have taken her an entire evening just took her five seconds. But there's something important that Zoe needs to be able to do with this information, and that's store it. So we give her streams. Think of them a bit like playlists of things to do. So Zoe's now going to create a stream for her weekend with Fred. So she goes, new stream. Gives it a title, simple description, so she remembers which date this is. Sets it to private. Gives it a cute little icon, and away she goes. Zoe's now going to pick a couple of things that she wants to do with Fred this weekend. So what have we got here? Ah, happy hour en français. Excellent. That's come from Meetup. She's thrilled. Language of love. So she drops it into her stream. Next, she's going to find one more thing to do. There we go. Courtesy of Eventbrite, you're me. That's awesome. All right, cool. She's now got her date with Fred sorted. So now when the weekend comes, all she does, is she goes to her stream, opens up, date with Fred, and she's good to go. But the best thing about these streams is they don't just have to be private. Zoe also has streams that she can co-own or share with members of her family or friends. So for example, here's a stream that she shares with her sister Emma, who lives 3,000 miles away. 
They see each other as often as they can, and when they are together, their time is special. So they put events into this stream together, they co-own it, and they have a chance to add their own events, so they really know what they're going to do. To them, this is the most effective social collaboration tool that either of them have ever seen. But actually, it gets better still. Streams don't just have to be private or just shared with your friends. Public faces and commercial entities can also create streams that anybody in the world can publish, create, can create, can subscribe to, and follow. So for example, Zoe is off to Los Angeles tomorrow. Hold on. Thank you. And she's going to set the time for tomorrow. There we go. And now she wants to find something to do. So she flips to Gablet's other interface, the calendar. She can see here what Gablet has recommended, but she's not interested in that. So she's going to turn off what's trending, and she's going to go to the streams that she's subscribed to. So here we can see she's subscribed to LA Weekly, Rock Gods, Lady Gaga, the W Concierge. And so now she's going to pick a couple. Fantastic. And then she can see there's a lot happening Tuesday, March 5th. But it's still not in context. So she's now going to go back, back to the map, and she can see what's happening that these people that she trusts have recommended around her right now. And she's going to pick one event, and she's going to save it in her LA stream. And now she's done. Those few hours that she's got, she's doing exactly what she wants. But coming next for Zoe, she's going to discover that Gablet can provide her with better personalization through its custom it channels, better relevancy in the searches that she asks for, and deeper social integration within and outside the Gablet platform. So what have we seen? We've seen a platform that has empowered Zoe to spend more time, less time searching, and more time sharing and doing the things she loves. Thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> Go ahead, Robert. You're just chomping um, at the bit. I know Brad's going to have some thoughts. He likes th this. There's a product in here somewhere, but it needs to be rethought for mobile and cut way down and made it, make it much more simple. Geeks like me would go nuts with this. I don't think an average user is going to do what you just showed. I, but I might be wrong. Answer the question. Do you think? What do you think? Um, what we needed to build was a tool set for the influencers out there. Because yeah. that's core to our user acquisition strategy. We need to have those tool sets for people who actually dictate the agenda of others. Whether it's your friend that recommends you a good comedy night or somebody with a greater audience looking to distribute to. Yeah, but the, can, can the you influence... open one more button on the shirt? <laughs> <laughs> if you open one more, it'd be just awesome. No, just <laughs> <laughs> Onto it now. Go ahead. Yeah, Next do, question. Do the, do the influencers really need a product like this? I feel like they already know where people are going. So you're attacking the wrong audience. Uh, it's, it's like the South by Southwest issue. Like it, it, you, so, you show up at South by Southwest, there's at least like 10 or 15 mobile apps that are like saying, here are all the parties, here are all the things to do, here are all the streams. You know, Plancast tried to do this with their, with their social calendaring. Like what's the, uh, what's the need you're trying to solve? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to understand what that, that, that need or product actually is. And I agree with Robert that there's... there's and South by is a great there. example. I, I have a map like this of my South by Southwest parties. But let's be honest, when Jason calls me up and says, I have a private party going on in my hotel room, I'm going there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a pretty good party. And, and I'm not sure... I've been to that party it. before. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. I mean, I, you draw that's a very good point there. Is most of the existing apps don't allow for that social curation context. Yeah. There are ones where you can find what's going on in isolation without the context. And there are some which will tell you where your friends are now or what they've already, they're already committed to their calendars to do. But what really matters when you're actually thinking about something is that recommendation of something from someone you trust and someone you care about and whether you want to attend with them. And having the toolkit to be able to pull that in and make it easy for people make, empowers those influencers to actually go about telling their friends and their communities what's going on. Here's I, another way to ask the same question. I'll, I'll yeah. jump in. I'm the influencer in Half Moon Bay. I, I'm the mayor on Foursquare of the Ritz. So if you come to the Ritz, you see my name. And people call me all the time and go, what else is there to do in town? What, what place should I go to tonight? Is there a banner? All the stuff that you were showing me. I'm always on my mobile phone. And I don't have the time in the moment while Jason called me on the phone and says, I'm at the Ritz and I'm bored to look up at that level of detail. So you're I, saying mobile. 
mobile and simplicity. Make it, cut it what down. What do you guys think? The, 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 the mobile experience is simple. It's an alpha at the moment. It'll be ready by the end of the month. Okay. But the, uh, the web experience is important for those that actually want to sit down and curate. If you're a blogger, you curate the, the things to do, not necessarily on the run. If you're going to be rethinking about a longer term strategy or you, what you want to share with people, if you happen to be. So are you saying it's like a moment of I'm going to Maui for a couple of days or whatever, I need to plan that out and that's a desktop computer thing, but when I'm in Maui, there is a mobile experience. Exactly. Got it. Let's take another question. I mean, my, uh, so it does feel to me like boiling the ocean here. It's a problem we all have. Um, I have, I have uh, two issues. Number one is if I use this and I get garbage, I'm never using it again, right? <laughs> And it seems to me it's really hard to do this without surfacing a bunch of garbage. And the second thing, much more probably personal for me, the name, really tough. Okay. So comment, I'll take the first question, the last question first. How, how bad do you think the name is and are you willing to change it? Um, the name is, it is relatively unique. It actually comes from a UK English to gavel about stuff as and communicate yeah. stuff enthusiastically to other people. So yeah. there is actually something drawn in there. Um, if so far, actually, the greater incidence of users have preferred the name than not. Okay. What about uh, gabble.com? Why don't you get that? Uh, I'm sorry? Why don't you get gabble.com then? Uh, we have gabble.co, we have gabble.it, we have a yeah, gabble I kind of like. Yeah, gabble's, yeah, you're gabble's a, fun. You're a consumer service and it's hard to type and remember this name. You, you know, it's one of the challenges you're going to have. In the Good feedback from the judges. And what about, what was the other question? Uh, um, oh, oh, bad results. Uh, How do you filter out all the garbage? Yeah. Um, so much garbage. In well, one sector. chance to make a first impression with this. It's about sure. Um, we do do a very good effort of understanding the, the nature of the event itself and use popularity from across the net in order to promote events within our system. But when it comes down to it, what Gablet is providing is the tool set for other people to recommend stuff. Right. So if you happen to have gone to somebody who you thought was the authority on what to do and they didn't give it to you, right. then turn around and look to the next guy who we've also provided the tools for. Right. I guess I, uh, the final point on that is, to Robert's earlier comment, if you truly help me discover a treasure, something I wouldn't have discovered on my own, you'll have somebody devoted. But if I get on there and I don't, and I went through this whole exercise yeah. and I actually didn't improve my life, I'm going to be really frustrated. I mean, I think, Sunday, correct me if I'm wrong, the, yeah. the issue is most people never hit their settings or personalization settings. I know when I was at AOL, they shared the statistic with me. It was like 2% of people would set up the My AOL or the My Yahoo homepage, and we would all be talking about it because we're in the industry. But right. net vibes and page plagues, it's like every, the, yeah. the startup graveyard is filled with I, startups that require you to do work first. I'm yeah, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, the other challenge you have is like, you know, I like Google Now, and what Google Now does really well is it has access to your email, and it's crawling through all that stuff, figuring out what you already like without you telling it. So huh. it is creating its own settings, and, I, and I, I, their recommendation stuff is getting better, but I think they're, they're a tough competitor in this space. I'm, I'm wondering if, if they did some customer research and segmented their customers a little bit better. For, for instance, the, media, the people who run hotels and you go downstairs at the Marriott and ask, ask that person for help, they would love a tool like this, They right? do. They do. <laughs> and maybe that's the market and you just dig in on them and ignore my advice and, and they will put up with complexity because they do it 50 times a day, right? That would be really interesting for a concierge to give yeah, this to nice. you with a, a short URL and then the short URL sends you to the mobile app with your itinerary in it. That could be an incredible viral strategy, Robert. And if it hooked up to things like Open Table or Eventbrite sure. right, and bought the tickets and got the <laughs> it's tickets. It's like my itinerary, but prepared by, on a computer by a concierge. Josh, what do you think? How are you going to make money? How do we make money? Why do you have to ask that? We obviously? Create that, the marketplace for those that have an what agenda to distribute information and those that obviously want to consume it. Yeah. Those that have an agenda to distribute, a number of which are already in our private beta, whether it's local clubs or whether it's something like an Amex concierge service who feel as though this will allow people to engage with what they're recommending better. Yeah. Um, we can go to them both for event promotion, affiliate services that Rob touched on, and also so a I, subscription model. So I, I, to the point about clarifying the product, each one, so we've backed companies in each one of the sectors. Each one you talked about is incredibly hard to execute on, like if you have to go to each venue. So I would really focus the product so that you can actually make money because yeah. if you try and sell to users, venues, influencers all at once, you're going to fail. Most great companies, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, make money one way from one customer. Yeah. 
And so when they hear it, and this is one of the things we talked about right in the sort of back in the, in the, in the rehearsals, when a VC like Josh hears, my company makes money three different ways from three different people, they think, oh, good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be rough. Um, you fascinated the audience. I think it's an interesting product and uh, very good. Well done. Let's hear it for Gabby. Thank you. Next up, Sightly. And this is a 2.0. All the others were 1.0s. So having to read a bunch of text to find and learn about local businesses is just painful. But the explosion of video and local search on mobile has allowed us to create a much better way. Sightly is launching an app that lets you see and truly experience the inside of a business before you go. Let me show you how it works. So let's say I want to take my team out to a really fun place to celebrate the launch of our app. And I'm in the mood for a good margarita. Well, I'm actually always in the mood for a good margarita, but I go to Sightly and I decide to type in margarita. And up comes a list of places that I can tell immediately from the familiar video play button which places that Sightly has captured professional videos for at no cost to the business. So I decide to check out what's nearby and I go to the map I can see also the familiar play button there too, but I prefer the list mode. So I go back to that, and I go to the first one to check it out because it's got a good rating. Let's see what it looks like. At Zucker Lounge, we um, opened about a year and two months ago. We have lots of fresh fruits um, and herbs. And I can spices. see very quickly uh, that this really isn't the kind of party place that I'm looking for. Might be a nice place for a lunch for my family, but it's not really the place that I was looking for. So I quickly go to the next place to check it out. The bank patio bar is something I built, but I didn't create. And what I mean is... Now what I love about Sightly videos is I get to hear the owner tell me their story so I can make a decision for myself if this is the place I like. And I can immediately see that this is the kind of place that my team is going to have a lot of fun going to. So I decided to check out, a little, learn a little bit more about this place. So I go into the listing, and I can see here that it's got good ratings, that it's nearby, and I also can see that other users have used the app to capture and share their own videos of their own experiences. And so I see right here that there's one that says, best margarita in town. Hey, I gotta check that one out, right? Let me check it out. So I've definitely found the place for my team to go celebrate the launch of our app. And without being able to see it for myself, I would not have been as easily to be able to do this as easy and quickly as I was able to, to really make the decision for myself. So how many of you would like to see videos like this to help you make a decision about where you'd like to go? Would you like to be able to see those kind of videos? Great. So this is really why we believe that video is going to forever change local search. And Sightly justifies creating these videos at no cost to the business because we've not only figured out how to make these videos for less than $100 each, but we also have our platform that leverages the video to help that local business get their video placed in front of their target audience. We do that a number of ways, including running an in-stream, locally targeted video ad campaign on YouTube as the first and only partner, a video partner of Google. So <clears throat> the success we've had over the last year has really proven that our um, platform works exceptionally well for local businesses, and we're in the middle of raising a round to launch our app in the top 10 markets in the United States this year and already have some fantastic early stage investors uh, on board. So I invite you to go to Sightly to learn when we'll be launching in your market. And of course, if you're interested in investing, please contact us. My name is John McIntyre. We are Sightly. See for yourself. Thank you. OK. Thoughts on a uh, better Yelp with video and professionally produced well, and consumer video? And that's where I'm confused. Is this going after the consumer? And in other words, you're going to rip Yelp out of my phone and put Sightly in there? 
or is it going after uh, Google and trying to get videos into Google or some other distribution method? Yeah, the primary purpose here of the app is to really give us the premise to go inside the business and capture the video because really our main part of our platform is to drive other types of traffic. So we're not only seeing it's really powerful in SEM, right? So from a video standpoint is what the product can do. We're not only using it in a distribution, we talk about syndication, but from the results that we're seeing in terms of response, memory, it's far better than broadcast, it's far better than classic uh, SEM. We're just seeing a lot higher response. And particularly, of course, from an SEO standpoint, the algorithms of Google are, are preferencing that. So, so I get why the merchant would want to create a video, but as a user, why would I want to download this? Like, like it's to Robert's question, I yeah. have Yelp on my phone. Yeah, I'm so, looking for margarita. Yeah, great know. question. Sorry, I didn't understand the first one. I've had a hard time hearing. I apologize. Um, you know, from our perspective, um, we use this app so you can actually find the video, right? A lot of people, um, you know, until it's ubiquitous across the internet where we can get our videos placed everywhere, syndicated everywhere, really looking for a spot now in your market, because we're going to launch market by market, allowing you to say, hey, once you go there, you're not going to really go anywhere else from a video standpoint. So the business model again, you're, uh, is this more of an enterprise riff and you guys are just doing, crossing this bridge because you're trying to catalyze the enterprise business, or do you actually think this is an end game, you know, it's, do you have a consumer Yeah, it's game? primarily an enterprise, it's obviously local. Our biggest customers are going to be the franchises, multi-location places, et cetera, they're trying to promote within their area. But from a standpoint, we have all this inventory that we're capturing, and we have the way to leverage that content. And quite frankly, I'm just frustrated as hell that I can't just see the inside of a business before I go. Okay. And I'm hoping to spur the industry into doing that. So Great. I think, you know, I, I agree with the idea that video is going to be important for search and that it can add a lot. You kind of lost me when you said professionally produced videos for free or even for 100 bucks. I mean, the, if I think through the, the workflow and what would be involved in getting full coverage, uh, especially when these videos are going to have to be updated and you know they're all over the country, you're either going to have to go vertical by ver uh, sorry city by city slowly, or you're going to have to have just an absurd number of people running around making videos all the time. I mean, is that is that your core competence producing it, these videos? Yes, yeah, you know, it's not. You wouldn't be. You may not be. You may be surprised by the number of people who have you know can really run the types of cameras that we need, the technology we have. We can penetrate markets very quickly uh, from the standpoint of the content. Now. Quite frankly, the user-generated stuff is also very interesting to us, right? And the more the people are getting used to sharing video, I mean, the, the phone is the catalyst. The people are going to stop wanting to read text on the phone or are going to want to watch video. So we hope to be able to drive both. Uh, but from a standpoint, we think we can get to the market pretty quickly. I'm wondering, you know, uh, I, I was in Palo Alto and I saw some girls dancing and somebody said, let's find this. Why couldn't you do, take advantage of the vine to get the content and not have to charge the, uh, the restaurant, you know, 100 bucks to get, because all I want to see is that this is a fun place. That's a seven second. Yeah, no, we're not, we're not charging the business anything. I want to be clear. We don't charge the business anything. Oh, I thought you were charging. No, that's what it costs us. Oh, we have okay. figured out how to make it cost that much. We no, don't charge the business anything. But your point's oh. like a trip advisor. You're, so you really are trying to go after Yelp to get Yelp, Yelp off my phone and get me to use your app instead of Yelp to look for margaritas tonight. I mean, that's, if that's, that's the direction it goes, that's the direction it goes. I mean, obviously, for our perspective, we just want video to dominate. Yeah, that's a tough thing to yeah. do. Robert, you're saying like TripAdvisor, so it's the user-generated content. I mean, when I, when I go to TripAdvisor and I look at the hotel, I actually don't want to see the professional video. I want to see the traveler pictures, which usually yeah. give you a lot better idea of what the place really looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so we're catering to two audiences where, for us, we're trying to create an unbiased view of the, of the place, where it's what you yeah. can get when you expect to walk in the door.